This episode was brought to you by a paid sponsorship for the awesome Kickstarter, Humblewood.net. Hey, so this is a recording that I made for something else, but it was really good, so I decided to release it as a one-off sort of podcast thing. Um, Enjoy. Hi, I'm Scott Kurtz. I'm a cartoonist that lives in the Seattle, Washington area. I am best known for my comics. Well, heck, I'm probably best known for being Benwin Bronzebottom on Acquisitions Incorporated, but I also draw comics called PvP and Table Titans. So, sorry, my levels are still... So you were you were saying, I don't think Stranger Things had no anything to do with the resurgence. I, they barely play the game in it at all. Yeah, they play it for a little bit, but it, it's a weird thing. Like people seem to think, like, okay, there was Stranger Things, and then D and D blew up, and it's like, nah, no, no, it was cool though. It was cool that it was in there. Yeah, I mean, you're going to say that that Stranger Things had more of a role on D and D's resurgence than Critical Role? Exactly. You can't. No. So, but that's that's kind of the thing, though. Is like, I guess, I mean, getting at. What I, what I was getting at initially was like, it's a, it, it is a weird thing that people seem to uh, not trace it back to the first people doing kind of performance D&D, which in my opinion is you guys. Um, I know I'm kind of guiding you to, <laughs> to it a little bit too much. <laughs> um, I have this discussion with Perkins all the time. Hmm. Uh at PAX Prime last year. I guess it's PAX West. You're not supposed to say Prime anymore. Oh, really? Uh, at PAX West last year, the Waffle Crew did a signing at uh, the Table Titans booth uh, because Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms um, and Codename Entertainment shares booth space with us. And they were hosting a signing. And there was just a huge, huge line that they had to manage for everyone coming to get Signatures by the Waffle Crew. And uh, meanwhile, Chris Perkins and I sat in the back of our booth. We have a little, like, Heidi Cubby where you can go back and, uh, and, and like, uh, regroup. And we were sitting there going, I'm like, look at the line for these kids, man. And he's like, I know. It's hard to think that we started this 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, we kind of did, didn't we? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, damn, that's... We had no idea it was even going to become this, but it did. Oh, yeah. No, abs- yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, I was talking to him um, a little last week about this, and, and he was saying that he, when he was initially pitched, <laughs> the idea was like, that's crazy. Nobody wants to watch people play D&D. This isn't going to work. Yeah. So what's interesting is that and and honestly, it's probably not fair to say Ack Inc. started it all because I'm I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, the way things work in our culture is a lot more complicated than just you know the first people that did it uh, are responsible for all of it. I'm, it's a probably a perfect storm of a lot of things, but um, you know the way that Ack Inc. started was that uh, I got called into Mike and Jerry's office. Um, because I was renting space. I was renting office space at the Penny Arcade building. Yeah. Uh, so it's just so I didn't have to work at home and, you know, uh, sit in a house by myself. It would be yeah. way cooler to work in a creative environment. So, um, But they called me in and said, hey, you know, Wizards of the Coast is launching the fourth edition of D&D. And they want a way to promote it. And they don't just want to do banner ads. And we were thinking, since Krahulix never played D&D before, which was a shock to me, it would be fun just to record a podcast where we play D&D. It was Mike's and Jerry's idea, I think, to just like, why don't we just play D&D and then everyone can listen and see. Yeah. Uh, and the point was that the point of the podcast was Mike was kind of afraid to play because he didn't have a rule book memorized and he wasn't sure he could role play or come up with stuff on the fly. And Jerry, who'd played his whole life, and I, who had played my whole life, were like, no, 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 it's it's a ton of fun. It's real easy. You'll love it. So it was it was their idea to just, let's just make a podcast and show everyone what it's like to actually play D&D. And I think that is the brilliance and I think also the DNA of what made Ack Inc. successful and why I was always a little bit resistant and kind of pissy about 
getting dressed up and all the stage theatrics and stuff because my whole life people playing D&D were portrayed as a bunch of nerds who dressed up and spoke in funny voices and you know went to school dressed up as elves oh, yeah and, you know it was it was a way to mock that when in fact we were just it was just a bunch of, of people like everybody else that were just playing a game and so I always I always preferred the PAX East shows to the and the podcasts over the PAX West show because it was just people playing D&D and showing what the pastime was all about. And I think it's also another reason why I can't get into Critical Role because I feel like Critical Role is very performative. And, um, you know, I, I really like D&D and that experience I grew up with. And that's... You know, we we weren't all sitting around. Yeah, you weren't you weren't professional voice actors from L.A. You know, putting on a show. I don't know. It's it's so it's so different now. But I I heard something about uh, Mercer having to almost like he put out an apology because people were putting too much pressure on themselves when they're playing, which I don't think is his responsibility at all. But. No, it's not. His responsibility is to make a great product. Oh, absolutely. And he's and he does it. And to and to leverage his talents to do it. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, anybody anybody doing one of these shows needs to lean on the thing that makes them kind of interesting in that context, right? Like you guys yeah. had a very specific game and Perkins talked about it a little bit where it was like it was really like just balls out crazy comedy of errors type game. Like every mm-hmm. and everyone was like a massive set piece and a bunch of insane stuff happened. Um, yeah. And he actually talked a little bit with me about and I think I might have framed the question. I mean, honestly, I don't remember the interview that well, but but he mentioned something about the idea of the difference between those two environments between running you in Ack Inc. and then also running you in uh, Waffle Crew. And how I did not. In, I, I, I hate to say it. I did not enjoy my time with the waffle crew. Yeah, I mean it it went No, and it's it had nothing to do with the waffle crew. It's that it's that how do I say this right? I felt like the I felt like the fourth wheel of that group. You know, they have their own thing, they have their own history. I haven't listened to to it because there's there's I just can't listen to uh, there's just too many hours of D and D podcasts. I can't. There's a lot. I can't listen to it all. Um, and so, it just felt like coming into the middle of a movie and not really understanding what had happened the first hour, not having a script and someone saying, "Okay, you're this character." It was easy for me to just fall back on. Well, I'll just be as Binwin as possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and and it ended up getting Binwin killed off. You know, which which was interesting, but also kind of disappointing because I, you know, not to their fault, but the Waffle Crew doesn't know me from Adam. They don't have any history of rapport with me, mm. and and so I don't know that they knew how to react to that happening either. So, well, yeah, it, it, it's just uh, well, it was an interesting thing because it, it just was a mismatch. Which I guess is is a is a beautiful portrayal of a mismatch because it happens with everybody, right? Where uh, it's not a bad group or a bad player. It's just like two different styles coming together. Like you drop fucking He Man into Game of Thrones, and of course he's gonna get wrecked. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's. It, I think that probably what I should have done, or what I probably would like to do from now on if I do guest on these things is just you know give me some give me someone to play besides Binwin that fits into what's happening oh yeah you know in the in their world and give them a reason to give a shit totally you know and and give me something that I can do that isn't just you know trying to figure out how Binwin fits into this and also you have to understand that my my way of playing D D, my interest in D D is very different than probably ninety percent of the people that play Dungeons and Dragons ninety five percent of the people that play Dungeons and Dragons. And I get bored with it very quickly and very easily. What so what's your what what piques your interest? I like 
I like character creation. I like coming up with cool characters and cool ideas and and uh, and then I get really bored with the minutia and I get really bored with combat. Um, nothing upsets me more than when a DM just goes, okay, roll initiative uh, because everyone stops playing D&D and now it's just, we're going to roll dice until the things that's supposed to be dead are dead, you know? Mm. And, and it's like, you know... Um, we we have this quest. We leave for the quest. We're on the road. We suspect there's an ambush. It turns out there's an ambush uh, that we probably could have avoided. We see how we could have avoided it or maybe dealt with it differently. And now the DM says roll initiative, and I want to just say, hey, man, why don't you just say you fight goblins and, and win and let's move on because we can save an hour, and we're obviously not going to lose these goblins. Well, that's an interesting that's that's an interesting thought though. Like, I wonder if the reason you disengage is because you know you're going to win. Well, I think that most DMs approach it as we're going to roll dice and see. This is going to be a conflict of attrition. Who has the most damage versus who has the most hit points? And right now, totally, we have them. We're going to win that, right? <laughs> but I think uh, I, I, that's why I've been kind of interested in. in other systems well, yeah, lately. I mean, you guys actually even started creating your own system to address some of this stuff, right? I have started incorporating other systems into my D&D games because I hate I hate the way that combat is handled in D&D. Mm. In the sense that, from a storytelling perspective, right? So, one of the things I really like about a system like Dungeon World is that combat is handled as a part of the story. If you come up on a sleeping guard... And he's, you know, he's been, you know, he's drunk. Yeah. And you decide, well, f- shit, I think I'm just going to stab him in the heart. You know, I I came up upon him. In D&D, the, you know, everyone would, you'd, you'd make your roll, you'd see what damage you did, and then he'd be like, nope, I guess you didn't kill him. Now he's awake and it's a fight. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, actually, something that I've done in most of my D&D games is I increase damage dice and reduce HP. <laughs> For that reason. Right. Well, because for a good reason, right? Yeah, because it sucks when it's just like, it doesn't make sense that someone can get hit in the face with a sword three times and be fine. Right. Like, no. But, and see, that's, that's, that's also, that's also, and so that's also the part that upsets me about, about D&D sometimes. And I, listen, it's not the fault of the designers. You have to come up with a system and, and that's a pretty good, a pretty good system. Um, I think one of the reasons why, I liked and disliked 4th edition so much was that the combat was more of a a tactical miniatures game and at least that had some interesting features to it. Yeah, absolutely, that makes sense. But like, you know, and I and listen, I know a lot of DMs that would just say, "Sure, you he's he's there's not going to be combat in here, no need to roll initiative, you murder the guy." You straight up murder the guy. There's some DMs that'll do that. Yeah. But a, there's a lot of DMs that just go by the rules and go, "Well, you know, he's got armor and you swing and <laughs> and you know, you hit his. I guess it deflected off his armor. But you know, when you're when you're 45 minutes into what's going to be an hour and a half of combat, it's just you roll the dice, you missed. Next person's turn, he rolled the dice, he hit. Now, which goblin is this? Which spider is this? Oh yeah. I just don't see the benefit. I don't see the fun in that. Have you heard of? Have you heard of? Uh, I think it's the angry DM wrote a an article about running combat like a dolphin. Have you heard this expression? Mm-mm. So um, actually, it's a way that it's one way that people can address that. And that's by after each mechanical tick n- narrating. Do you know what I mean? Like like if you're a DM and somebody shoots a goblin, you say, you know, the arrow soars into into the goblin's chest. And as he stumbles back, he moves just into range of you, Torvald. What do you do? You know what I mean? To like instead of yeah, uh, <laughs> instead of just being like. It hits. Okay. No, I know. <laughs> I, I and I I agree. Uh, and I and I I think good DMs do that. And certainly, you know, I've I've been spoiled with with dungeon masters. So. Oh yeah, I mean, fuck yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. You played with Perkins. Fuck. I played with Perkins. I've played Krahulik's a great dungeon master. Jerry's an amazing storyteller. He's a great dungeon master. Yeah, Jerry's got um, got like this weird version of the game that, that like. 
that only <laughs> he seems to be able to do. Like a few times I've tried to like do a Jerry style thing and I'm just like, no, nah, I don't have it. Oh, uh, he he did a he did a home game for us one time. I think he incorporated it into a C team at one point, but it was uh it involved all of us trying to rescue a changeling baby. Mm. And there was a, a wagon chase, uh, like a horse-drawn carriage chase, uh, with these silvered uh, chain whips that were being swatted at us. And he had a beginning and a middle and an end to the story, and it all just kind of executed perfectly. And it was just this perfect night. It was, yeah. it, and I, I mean, you don't. Everyone doesn't get that. No, you know, everyone doesn't get the guy who spent. 20 years coming up with stories and stuff being your DM. So, um, or one of the guys that helped design. I mean, even in the regular game I played locally for a while at Mike Failauer's house, my DM was Rodney Thompson, who was, um, he wrote Dusk City Outlaws and, and, uh, he was a designer at, uh, at Watts. He worked on fifth edition oh, wow. and, and worked at Bungie. So like, like, not everyone gets the DMs I get. Um, oh yeah, and I'm a shitty player, so <laughs> God bless those DMs. Yeah, so I can crack a joke, but that's about that's about my my foray. <clears throat> and I get bored. Like I said, I get bored real easily. Um, yeah, that I mean that makes sense. And I have though. since I was a kid. Sorry, I think I was the kid that was always drawn. Oh yeah, sorry. I think I've got I've got a slight delay on you. So if I if I like horn in on you talking it's because i'm hearing silence when i start but uh so okay i realized that you weren't expecting to dress up for the stage shows maybe initially did you guys dress up for that first show the podcast no the first uh the first stage show you did no Mm -mm. no it was a it was a smaller theater oh boy i don't think we dressed up for the first one then the second one i wore a helmet Everyone had like one little piece. Yeah, I think Jerry had shoulders, and Mike had a cape. I had the helmet, and uh, Will got a uh, a cloak. That was uh, that was all we had for the second one we did live. I think, and it just started. It just started. It just kept growing from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They got more and more. They're still getting more elaborate. Um, but the uh, yeah. When did when did the other shoe drop for you? Um, and you realized that this was having like a real cultural impact. Um, Hmm. Probably, probably much later than it should have. Um, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I probably should have realized much earlier that it was a, a bigger deal than it was. I'll tell you two. There's two things that stand out in my mind. Um, the first one was when I, because I'd been doing packs for a while, and uh, first I was in Bandland, and then we ended up getting to a size where we had to move to the exhibit hall. So we've been we've been exhibiting at packs for years, and um, you know we do really well at the show, and and um, what started happening was I would be sitting at the booth. And someone would turn the corner and see me, and their eyes would get really wide, and they'd just shake their head, and they'd go, what are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you just sitting out here? Oh, wow. Because... And I'd say, they, they, because they knew me as Binwin. They had no idea well, yeah, you're, that I was a cartoonist. Yeah, you're a cartoonist. Like, people don't... I mean, people who know who cartoonists are do that occasionally, I'm sure, but it must be very rare. Yeah, no. Um, that That was um that was a big one um people started noticing me in public as Benwin um either at Pax or in public we were I was pumping gas one time and this kid was staring at me my brother was in my car and then the uh, across from us someone else was pumping gas and the kid in the car was staring at me and I'm like what is this kid staring at and then the the dad noticed he was staring and looked at me and he goes oh you're the you're the dwarf from the D and D show we watch. We're big fans, and so that was really weird. And then the second thing I noticed was my wife and I went and saw Eddie Izzard in concert um, at the Paramount Theater in in Seattle. Oh wow! Yeah, and we were we were sitting in the theater, and 
was before the show and I was just looking around and I'm like, this is a beautiful theater. I mean, like, this is really beautiful. And she's like, yeah, I, I told you. And I said, um, have you been to a lot of concerts here? And she's like, uh, a couple, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, this is my first time here. And she looked at me and kind of laughed. And I go, what? She goes, are you kidding me? And I said, no. And she goes, this is not your first time here. And I said, yeah, it is. She goes, <laughs> honey, you've performed here. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she goes, this is the theater that you guys do at Kink in. Oh, wow. And I'm like, it is? But we always come in. With like. <laughs> we would always come in the back. So we would always walk from the convention hall down to this building and go in the back door. I never realized that that I never saw the I never saw the it from the other side. I never saw the seats because when you're on stage, you can't see beyond stage lights. The stage. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the first row. Yeah. But it's it's pitch black, and so I'm like, "What are you talking about?" She's like, "This is where you guys do Ack Inc." And I go, "We do Ack Inc. here." And she's like, yeah, you guys fill this up. And she's like, I think that you filled it up more than Eddie did. And I'm like, no. And she's like, I think so. And so I was like, wow, I did not know that was this theater. And I'm like, so this is your experience when you're watching us. And she's like, yeah, we come in here and we wait and then the lights go down. Then you guys go. I'm like, wow. I go, that's kind of. And then for the rest of the night, I was like, wow, that's kind of a big deal. And she's like, yeah, it is. And I'm like, I just, it, it, that threw me for a loop. Oh, for sure. And because we saw, we saw, we've seen a couple people there. We've seen Alton Brown there. We've seen uh, Eddie Izzard there. We, uh, um, Carol Burnett gave a talk at the Paramount we went and saw. Oh, wow, well, yes. You know, Holland Oates played there. <laughs> so. Yeah, so you like, it, it took that for it to kind of sink in. That was the theater that you were in. Because I know Jerry a few time, times has like mentioned that that's when it sank in for him. But they organized those events. So he probably saw that theater earlier in the day empty and went, fuck. <laughs> like, Yeah, and you do that. You, you, nothing scarier than the empty theater. And then trying to figure out the line outside if it's going to fill it at all. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, definitely. So... What is, um, what's the experience like of actually trying to play D&D &D in front of a live audience? Because you guys are kind of the only ones who did that regularly at all. Um, there are a few other people who do it uh, now, but. I I love it. I find it to be incredibly fun. Um, and I love playing off the audience's energy. Um and I love that they give a shit, you know, yeah. that that it's something that entertains them uh, is is exciting in itself. So um, um, one of the things I like to do, and I've done it all the time, even when I do live streams and stuff on online is. I get very, uh, I can get adversarial with the audience. <laughs> um, it's fun. It's fun. Like, uh, there's one, there was one show and people still come up and quote me on this, but, uh, there was one show where I just couldn't fucking hear a thing because they weren't giving us monitors on stage. So, um, when you're mic'd like that, your voice, your voice goes out. So everything you say, everything everyone in the room, everyone on stage says, goes into a mic and is projected away from you. And um, it becomes kind of hard then, to hear. Yeah, I mean, it's it's impossible to hear anyone on stage with you because um, the sound of their voice kind of echoing in out there in the audience responding will overwhelm your ability to hear them across the table. And that's why... Um, I guess when you watch people sing on stage, they have shit in their ears because they have to be able to hear their own voice and it's being fed back to them. It's called a monitor. And usually there's a couple speakers on stage that aim back at you so you can hear what everyone's, what everyone's saying. And so one time on stage, there was this uh, choice I had to make, you know, do I do this or do I do that, you know, kind of thing. 
And the audience is screaming at me. They're just like, oh, do this. Blah, blah, blah. And Jerry's trying to talk to me. And I can't fucking hear him at all. I can't I can't make it out. And I just turn to the audience and I go, hey, who's fucking this chicken? You or me? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, everyone laughed. And, <laughs> and I was like, Jesus Christ, shut up. You know? Oh, wow. And, and uh, it was funny. And later, you know, Wheaton was like, trying to give me notes on don't do that. Yeah. And um and afterwards Krahulik's like that's that's what the audience wants from you. They that you've established you yelling at the audience is your thing. And I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> Will doesn't know that. I thought you I, I'm sure in Hollywood I'm sure in Hollywood when you're <laughs> I I 100% thought that that was, sentence was going to end with you established dominance. Yeah. You got to establish dominance over this audience. <laughs> yeah, um, I was like, "Shut up! I'm playing D and D. You're watching." Yeah, oh, but they're... you know, and they thought it was funny. I don't know, it was funny. Sh- I mean, it's like, uh, it's like, it's like someone going backstage and telling Don Rickles, "Don't, don't insult them. They paid to see you." Oh, for sure. Yeah, you know. Well, but also, so, you guys were more of a. It was a comedy show in a lot of ways. More than anything else. I mean, that because you, Mike, and Jerry are, were all really, like, quick-witted. Three guys that, three guys that grew up using humor to, to deflect all their problems played D&D together. Yeah. You know? No, 100%. <laughs> um, oh, wow. And we loved making each other laugh. And Mike and I really had a good thing going back and forth. We could really make each other laugh. And Jerry was a great straight man. Oh, yeah, totally. You know? Well, you guys had... You had so, Jerry as a... As like a really good straight man stand-in from time to time. And then also Chris ran it so stoically. Oh, Chris is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chris is a good straight man, too. And the funny thing is, is that... Is that, you know, a good straight man is hilarious in their own right. And Jerry... Jerry and Mike, uh, or Jerry and Chris, both are um, the kind of guys who. Krahulik and I tend to s- to s- s- shotgun, you know, it's a scattergun thing. It's like get as many jokes out there and and see what sticks. And then Chris and Jerry are more reserved. And then when they say something, it's got like a hundred times the power of yeah, the snipers. Oh man. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's killer. When they finally drop a joke, man, it's nuts. Yeah. Fuck. I mean, I think that, I think that that is something, um, that I, I mean, I I think the audience in general definitely does miss the, uh, the Jim and Benwin, man, the, the back and forth between you guys was fucking amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we had a similar sense of humor and we played off each other really well. And that, that to me, it was what I, what I found very interesting and, and ultimately disappointing was that to me, Ack Inc. was uh, about the interplay that Mike, Jerry, and I had after knowing each other the way that we did over the course of, you know, 10 to 15 years and having worked with each other for 10 to 15 years. And that's, that's what the appeal was. Um, and so, um, that to me is, that to me is what the heart of Ack Inc, you know, was. So, yeah, absolutely. It was kind of you guys letting us into your friendship for, an hour, you know what I mean? Right. And I and I've I've had people express that to me directly. Um that that, that was the appeal of it was uh the, the friendship aspect, right? Oh, absolutely. So that's why it was so disappointing to find out that my value to them was was more of a guest spot. And not uh, of a collaborator, 
And that's ultimately why I chose to leave was because I'm interested in collaborating on projects and working on things that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very blessed in the sense that for the longest time, the only way you could really make a living doing creative stuff is working for someone else. Right. I mean, yeah. even in comics, you, you had to, you get, you had to be discovered by a publisher you know, whether you were a cartoonist that the syndicate owned your work or you worked at Marvel and you got to work on characters they owned. Um, it wasn't until the 80s and the black and white comics kind of indie revolution and all that stuff. And then with us in the 90s, the Internet, that it, it just did not become d the default that if you wanted to have a creative uh, life, you had to split your ownership with other people and, and Mike and Jerry understand that as well. So, you know, that's why I think ultimately it was so disappointing to me to find out they believed that they owned it because it started off with an ad buy from them and that my job was to show up and be Binwin and take my check and go home. Well, that, so I that, mean, there's, and I did it for 10 years, yeah. so it's not like, yeah, I mean that 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 makes that definitely makes sense. I mean, then the 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 positive though maybe is that clearly you at least owned Binwin because you went on to sort of spin that off into Table Titans, right? Yeah, I mean we had started Table Titans well before at my association with Act Inc. ended, um, but. Uh, Table Titans had started well before that. Mm. And and Binwin, I've always owned Binwin. Um, one of the things that we made clear to Watsi with that first podcast was that we would maintain ownership of our own characters. And they've, you know, uh, I, I don't think, I don't think that's changed for anybody. I would assume that, that uh, Chris and, and Amy and, um, you know, of course, Patrick, they all own, you know, their characters. Oh, so that's, that's, that's an interesting way to sort of distribute ownership though. Like it's funny to think it's very interesting to think of it that way, that people can have these, these characters that they can bring with them from place to place. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is. I, I, I it's, um, I don't know that it's ever been done before in any other form of media, right? Yeah. It would be like, imagine if you went to work for Marvel Comics and you owned the characters that you made, and then you could go to DC and bring your character over there. Yeah, that would be nuts. And like, and then doing that would be nuts. Just like do an indie Spider-Man run for a little bit, and then pop him into Archie Comics for a little bit, and then move him yeah. over just wherever you want to go, <laughs> whatever you want to write for. And they've got to hire you. Yeah, that's crazy. Corey, uh, Corey's told me that, um, like in Japan, when you create a character, like let's say you created Mega Man, yeah, the company owns it, but they would never do a new project without you. Okay, so out so of you, respect. Oh, cool. So like in the contract somewhere, there's a. There's, there are approvals, right? I don't even know. You know, you'd have to ask Corey. I don't even know if it's in the contract. I just think it's a matter of of the culture that I don't think it would ever occur to them to <laughs> not include the other person. What an interesting thread to stumble on. I just want to do an episode about this now. Fuck. That's such a cool well, idea. I mean, it's super... See, what's, here's what's really interesting to me, okay? So... One of the things that I want to do uh, is I want to get my wife to read Lord of the Rings. She's never read it. Mm. And um, that's a big task because, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, Tol Tolkien is not, and I've, I've explained this to her, that Tolkien is not a good storyteller. He's a great world builder. Um, but sometimes you're reading Lord of the Rings and you're like, this guy is n not a good storyteller. Like, Oh, yeah. No, it's like, uh, these books are, it's like Lovecraft. We are just like, oh my God, <laughs> get on with it. Yeah, you're like, uh, you're like reading the story and, and then you're like, um, 
who will take the ring to Mordor? And you're like, oh, it's getting good. And then all of a sudden it's like, the elves have 15 words for leaf. Where the fuck is Strider? What's going on? Yeah. Um, but uh, there, there are moments there. I don't know. I, like I was trying to explain to Angie, like, uh, I don't know what it is in me. And I think this is, it goes back to me being super into to D and D and why I'm into D and D and what, what parts of D and D interest me. But um, there, uh, there's this part in Lord of the Rings, these little asides where um, when they go to Helm's Deep mm. and they're hiding from the orcs there, there's this little aside about Gimli saying to Legolas like, oh man, these caves are fucking crazy. And if we survive this, when we're old men, we need to come back here and explore these caves. And Legolas is like, yeah, totally. And then when they go to Gondor, I think there's something about Legolas saying it's a beautiful city and and how he, if they survive this, he'd like to return and, and bring like elven plants and stuff to it. And then at the end, it kind of tells you that like Gimli and Legolas did go back to Helm's Deep and explore those caves. And the elves came and they, they prettied up the white citadel yeah. and those mo- I'm just like oh I don't know why I'm just like and I tell Angie I don't know if that's a good story but I, it's I'm so into it like I'm so like it's so important to me like Gimli went back like so <laughs> no totally I, I, I do this all the time I tell so my dad you know my dad's been through a lot in the last couple of years and he's had a couple strokes and mm-hmm. and he came to live with us and, and uh, we were sitting around one night and he has a dog named Kaiser who we got him after his first stroke in 2011. We got him a puppy because we knew it would make him active and give him something to focus on. And uh, that dog really helped him, I think, kind of bounce back from his first stroke mm. because he needed to get off his ass and take care of a puppy. You can't just half ass that. And, um, that dog was his only companion for, uh, you know, two or three years until he came to live with us. And so, um, I was talking to, we were sitting there one night and I was petting Kaiser and I go, Oh, Kaiser, my brother, my brother, you know, uh, cause he's my dad's son. So I guess technically he's my brother. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then I said, I said, Kaiser von Kurtz ring bearer. And dad goes, why do you call him ring bearer? And I said, well, because he's shared the burden of taking care of you his job was to make sure you are okay. Just like my jobs to make sure you're okay. And, and he's that he's carried that burden. And so in the end, we'll, he gets to join me on the boat. We get to go to the gray Haven. <laughs> and my dad's like, what? And I'm like, okay. So, and then I'm like real stoked to explain this. I go, so, you know, in the Hobbit movies, he goes, yeah. And I go, okay, well the elves were diminishing. The elves were from this other place or right? they're from their lands. And they were only on in middle earth for a little bit. And then they had to return home. And so this place, they don't really tell you 100% what it is, but they just call it the Grey Havens. It's just like wherever the elves go to live forever. But not everyone gets to go there, right? You don't just get to go there if you want to. The elves go there. But um, they made a change to the rules so that if you were a ring bearer, you got to go with them. And so um, uh, Frodo, Bilbo got to go and Frodo got to go. Um, and I said, and, and they, they kind of hint that should Sam ever want to go, he could, he could go too. And, and the reason why is because when Frodo collapsed, Sam carried him. So technically he's a ring bearer too. Cause he carried it for a little bit <laughs> and dad started to cry, you know? And I'm like, I know, right. It's fucking cool. Like, I just don't know why that shit gets me. And it's not like, um, it's not like that's an Oscar winning screenplay or something, but it's just that tidbit, that little piece yeah. of that backstory, that lore that just fucking gets me hard. I oh, don't yeah. know why well, it really floats my boat. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about stuff like that from a time before the genres had a shorthand for everything. Yeah. Um, it, it does make sense that you wouldn't have to, like sort of slice those darlings 
off of a a, a manuscript, right? Like like now yeah. people want to get there, and they are they already know about the background, and and there's a lot of like cultural markers and shorthand that that's being used that increases the pace of the story to a degree where if you started talking about you know the gray isles or like where the elves go when they you know when they've done good deeds and whether or not a ring bearer is like the audience would go like what the fuck is this like what am i watching right now right the, people <laughs> probably yeah but but also like um this is going to be a weird a weird movie to compare it to but I feel kind of similar about the movie Tombstone. <laughs> Tombstone. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and the, and I it's just because you watch that movie and there's a part of your brain that's like, I wonder what part of this is true and I wonder what part of this is made up and there was a real Wyatt Earp and like, you know, Virgil Virgil was shot and had to retire and and Morgan was assassinated and you know, Ike Clampett was real, but the screenplay has there's these little moments that stand out to me that that movies these days don't leave space for like we went and just saw battle angel alita and it was it was great but it was a spectacle you know i mean it was it's a spectacle and i even told my dad going into it like there's going to be a lot of robots fighting each other and shit's going to be moving around really fast there might be times where you just don't know what the fuck's going on and don't worry i don't either. <laughs> it's not your stroke and he's like okay i'm like it's just the way movies are made now but within that same week, I rewatched Tombstone, and there's a scene in that movie where everything's gone down, the OK Corral's happened, the Cowboys have made everyone's life miserable in, in Tombstone, they've, they've fucked up Wyatt's family, and most of them have left, right? So Morgan's dead, Virgil's taken the women, and Wyatt stays behind and gathers up a posse to hunt down the rest of these outlaws, right? And Doc stays behind. And Doc Holliday is straight up on death's door, dying of tuberculosis. And they're out by this river. It's just a quiet moment. They're out by the river. And um, they, there was a big gunfight. And someone says, you know, God, I've never seen anything like that before. You know, what Wyatt just did. And Doc is just coughing up a lung. And someone goes, damn it, Doc what are you doing here? You know, you should be in bed. Why are you even here? And Doc Holliday says, Wyatt Earp is my friend. And the guy, I think it's Cactus Jack, he goes, hell, I got lots of friends. And Doc Holliday says, I don't. Uh. And that, that to me is, you know, you don't, I mean, the, the amount of story told in that line, like it, that character motivation, that, that moment that's powerful to me and it just it, it enriches both characters and I I live for those moments in movies and I like the gunfights too but the gunfight was important because that's what the stakes were involved for for him oh yeah totally it's the reason why the first Matrix movie was so awesome and the rest of them were such bullshit it's because the fights in the Matrix movie were revolutionary visually, and they were just rad to watch from a science fiction point of view, and they were a fun spectacle. But there wasn't one fight in that movie that didn't have gigantic stakes in the Matrix. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. But what's funny... Every fucking fight in that movie had giant stakes attached to them. What's funny, though, is that you're coming at this from different angles, because also... The the thing people complain about about the later Matrix movies is is that they kind of fall down these weird rabbit holes that you're not like that nobody's that interested in or like don't move the plot forward directly, which is kind of the which is no, the Hobbit I mean, thing. They, like. I think they look. I think they got kind of up their own asshole a little bit, but you can't you can't you can't blame them, and you also can't know. Um. 100% what part of that is is their fault and the fault of just the machine uh, that cranks out movies. Well, totally. I, you know who does those types of scenes really well? Those kind of asides um, that you were talking about earlier that 
it strikes me that the Coen brothers are the masters of that. That like weird. They are great at it. <laughs> where you're just like, it's just one scene. It doesn't make sense really. It doesn't necessarily move the plot forward, but they give you a whole universe. <laughs> yeah, no, they do. I mean, the the um, the Coen brothers are great at it. And the Coen brothers are great at the concept that escalation is problematic, right? Mm. And it's like um, the Marvel movies or, or you know, things like that. I mean, uh, when the stakes are saving the galaxy, where do you go from there? Yeah. Right? There's, there's nowhere to go up. Oh, yeah. So if you keep the stakes small and personal... Um, I think it's more intimate and I think it's more powerful. And then also there's somewhere to go. Oh, totally. Well, it's like if, um, if a movie character crawls on their, their elbows and knees over glass, like I'm like, ah, fuck. But if they get shot, I, I'm like, okay, he'll be fine. Right. And, and, and I think that's why whenever you're watching a movie where, uh, like a, let's say like a lethal weapon movie and 12 people are killed, you don't flinch. Yeah. But the minute a dog is wounded, you're like, no, what is this? Yeah. Um, well, and also because a dog is a dog and a, and a person dying in a movie is a stunt man. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's just, that's what they're there to do. They're stunt men that are there to fall onto cardboard boxes when they're shot. Yeah. But a dog, a dog is already equates more emotion and empathy and as a character than, than that. So oh, yeah, I mean, every, every um, time uh, my wife and I see uh, any animal or insect on camera, we have a joke where we just go, "That dog doesn't know it's acting," <laughs> or like, yeah. like it's just a dog. <laughs> it's not a character. Well, those moments are what I'm after when I play D and D. I get really bored in between them. I've I've experienced them. I've helped define them and it's certainly what everyone carries away from the table yeah um and i think everything else personally should facilitate that and and certainly when people come up to me and tell me something and reference a live game they watched they say double axe to the back or or something like that they don't say that time you rolled of 18 and with your modifier it was 27 Oh, totally. Yeah. You know, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's about the, it's obviously about the story for an audience. Um, yeah. Well, and, and, and you're your own audience when you're playing the game. So one of the reasons why, and I do this and I try to do this in table Titans all the time is that, um, you know, the whole concept behind the character of Val is that, um, over a period of time, um, things that you experience in real life go from um, something that's happening in the present to a recollection. And the longer that time passes, the less detailed that recollection gets. And after enough time has passed, it's there is just a distance uh, of truth between the actual experience and the recollection to a point where it's almost fabricated at that point, your recollection of it, you know, it's, it's a story about an experience that you once had, as opposed to a, a, a an actual account of it. Um, and, uh, I, I think that's why, um, you hear people say, Oh, I rewatched this movie again. And you know what? It does not hold up. But up until that point in their head, it did because their recollection of it is different. And so the concept of, of Val is that she is a person that has come to recognize that the experiences that she has, the memories that she has in a, a generated memory, like a D and D story. Um, since that's a story and at some point your memories are break are basically stories. Then instead of saying, well, that's kind of bum. That's kind of a bummer that my actual experiences are pretty much just made up stories. By the time I've enough time has passed, she looked at it from the other point of view, which is, well, that means the stories I'm experiencing in D and D are just as real as the real things I'm experiencing, and that's important to me because I can control those better, 
and that that's what's in it for Val is Val is in it to to get those moments and, and generate those moments where she can sit with her friends and go remember when we did this and we did this and we did this and I, and I have more control there's more safety in that than you know things that might happen in real life where you don't have as much control over it and that that's what's exciting to her about the game and why she takes it so seriously whereas Alan takes the game seriously because he's a rules lawyer or something mm. like that um and uh, one of the things I try to do also in Table Titans is is point out that the the hardest part of D and D is um, not memorizing the rules or learning how to role play. It's finding a group of people to play with. That's the hardest. Oh, part. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, and and when you find that, it's it's incredible. It's valuable. Um, and so friendship, just like it is at the heart of everything I write, friendship is the is the core. Friendship, the maintaining of it, and the importance of it is the core um, element of of all of my, I guess what you would call writing, if you want to call comic strips writing. I, I want to call them writing. <laughs> okay, I appreciate it. I'm hard on myself sometimes. I'm not writing a novel. I'm not writing prose or anything, but... Yeah, but, I mean, I don't know. I, they're, I, they're the core of my stories. Yeah, I fucking love Table Titans, so... But, oh, so, there's, um... What made you decide to incorporate um, Binwin specifically into Table Titans? Is it, like does Acquisitions Incorporated exist as a podcast in Val's world? So, no, it doesn't. Okay, uh, I've never addressed this in um, 100% in Table Titans or PvP. Okay, this is a separately recorded major, major spoiler warning for Table Titans. Uh, Scott is going to reveal one of the one of the possible endings. Uh, so probably uh, now would be a good time to tune out if you don't like spoilers. It is a possible ending. It might happen. It might not happen. But uh, yeah, you've been warned. Um, I I hope to get to it soon, and I don't mind spoiling it, but. Mm-hmm. So Val, okay, so the way that I want to do it is to create an analog for me in Table Titans. So it's not that Val knows Scott Kurtz and he plays Binwin and I somehow know Val. And So the way that it works is this. Val Bronzebottom uh, is not her real name. Her real name is Val Winters. And her uncle is Ben Winters. And so Ben Winters plays D and D and played D and D with her when she was little, and his character was Ben Win, which is a playoff Ben Win, oh. Ben Winters. Okay, and so his character Ben Win—that's the character he's played, you know, for a long time. And so since Ben taught her D and D, she made uh, her character be the niece of her uncle's character. And since Val values her D and D life much more than she values her, her, her <laughs> she values her D and D memories more than her real memories. Uh, she goes by Bronze Bottom, probably, and she, that's why she's always dressed up as a dwarf, because um, she's she's so into into that stuff that she's probably always LARPing is kind of a defense mechanism. Whereas like someone like Mia Krahulik would use humor. She she hides and protects herself with this persona. She's a badass, you know, shield dwarf, and her last name's Bron Bottom, Bronze Bottom, and she comes from a line of dwarves, and she really gets into it. So uh, Ben played with analogs of Mike and Jerry, and I don't know if I ever do this, what I'll do for their analogs. I probably, you know, won't be able to use Jim and, and uh, uh, Omen, but I'll do analogs of it. So yeah, that's that's how it works. That's that's um, that's a super cool idea. So um, now, if you really want to get okay, I, really really deep into it, I do. I have an idea. <laughs> I have an idea that that <laughs> had had my relationship and and association with Ak Inc. stuck around. This is what I would have done. 
what I would have done is I would have revealed eventually that this is the story, okay? The story is that Binwin Jim and, and Omen went on a quest to find this thing called the Forever Stone, which was essentially a wish, uh, a rock with the wish spell. And because Binwin is such a shit and pressed on and pressed on, he ended up getting to the end of the dungeon and finding the Forever Stone, but it cost Jim and Omen their lives. So when he gets the Forever Stone and he makes a wish, he says, I wish this was, this was just a story. I wish this was not, it hadn't happened, it was just made up. And the, the stone says, granted, wish granted. And Binwin wakes up on Earth as Ben Winters, and all of that was a story that he played with his friends in D&D. So Jim and Omen are alive, but they're now people on Earth who are playing a game of D&D. That? And it's me, Mike, and Jared. That is so rad. That's such a cool idea. And then... And then, um, eventually the Table Titans will find the adventure that it's based on and start playing it. And the same thing happens. And then when Val gets the Forever Stone, it starts to kind of undo it, kind of starts to undo the wish spell as they get closer and closer to realizing that this, this is what happened because as they're playing it, real things start happening to them. They start realizing they're actually experiencing it and not just playing the game. Mm. And it's the, the, because they're by playing the module, they're, they're breaking the spell. And so they, they figure it out what to do. And then, um, I think, I think what we wrote was that in order to keep it just to being a story, you have to believe in the story, and that means to continue to role play and believe in these stories. And then uh, that's why it's important to play D anD D because if not, you'll undo the wish spell that Benwin made and undo the world. So everyone should play more D anD D. That's cool. Because the spell the spell operates by people believing that the story is real. That's interesting. The story predicated on the wish that Benwin made, and I, I have it written down somewhere, but. I, I wouldn't know how to tell that story now that my relationship with Ak Inc. has ended. But I can maybe find a way somehow. But yeah. that's kind of pie in the sky. That, but what's definitely canon right now is that Binwin is a character played by Val's uncle, Ben Winters. That's, and I will introduce that at some point. That's super cool. I, Which is cool in its own it right. It is cool in its own right. I So, that's interesting. But also, would... Okay. I've sent you down so many rabbit holes. I don't know how you're going to use any of well, this. Well, look, I'm only, <laughs> I'm making a pretty short video. I've got a lot of interview. Like this stuff is just this. You should just release some podcasts too. I was thinking I maybe should because the conversations, the, the, cause I just talked to you, Jerry and um, Perkins, right? Uh, right. And the, Jesus, that's great. I know a lot of people that want to listen to that. Dude, I'm for real. Like, like I've each one of them. I I like walk away and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and this one, we'll just post them on. Listen, you can just do. A lot of people post podcasts on YouTube, and you just put an image up, right? I could probably. I would. I mean, if I uh, don't try to animate, I'm not. No, fun. it'll never go. <laughs> no, up. I'm, I'm, no, I would never do that. Jesus Christ. Okay. The, the three-hour animation. If the metrics would do well, yeah. but it would take me a year. Um, well, you could just do character animator. Oh god, yeah, I guess I could. I mean, that's coming, right? That's coming down the pipe. So, but the interesting thing to me, though, about the story you just told me, um, yeah, is would Val? Well, I guess I don't. Maybe mm. this is the point, but would would Val uphold reality if she had a choice? Oh, yeah, she needs to. Oh, really? Okay. She only exists because the wish made the current reality. 
I see. She, she, as she exists, only exists because the wish spell changed reality to our current reality. Yeah, but I mean her character, though. So if you ever, so okay. if you ever wish D and D was real, it used to be, and Binwin fucked it up. And now, now that now we have our world, Trump is because of Binwin. <laughs> because of a wish spell he made. That's interesting. Oh. He wished that this whole thing had just been a story that someone told and the wish spell said granted and he created a whole new reality where all these stories, all these things that happened to Benwin were just stories from a, a game they played called Dungeons and Dragons. Dude, I, lo- I love that. I really like that a lot. Um, I know. But I know. Copyright but me. Copyright you. The... The... the the <laughs> my, the problem the problem <laughs> is that I'm an escapist, so in my, I I I want them to undo it. <laughs> like why they have best of both worlds that's now? That's true. Val exists and D and D exists. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I think I, just because of <laughs> but at, at, but I but I, I really like that. I remember at the beginning of. Uh, Surviving Creativity, you mentioned that there was a plot arc that you told to either Corey or your brother, and it and it blew their mind. And I'm guessing that this is this is that arc. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Fuck, dude. I don't know. All right. Well, uh, uh, I mean, that. <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it now. Yeah. I don't even know if you should post this. Uh, well, listen. To, um, tell me. No, you have you have my permission absolutely to post it. I don't care. I mean, that's a that's so cool. That thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching this episode brought to you by the Humblewood.net Kickstarter. Humblewood's a campaign setting and adventure for 5e. It's got a whole new set of bird races, new monsters, and incredible art, all from the awesome people over at deckofmany.com. Link in the description and hopefully on screen right now.